So I'm going to continue in the series of uh, epics, uh, presentations on, on learning epics uh, with a talk this morning about um, sort of how to use area detector. I'm going to uh, talk about sort of the motivation and the goals for area detector, overview of the architecture, and then talk about uh, all the drivers that are available for various kinds of detectors and cameras. Uh, talk about the plugins that can be used for real-time processing, including things like saving the data to disk files. Many of you have heard uh, a presentation like this before, so, but, but some of you have not. So I've got to kind of start from the beginning, but I will try to emphasize uh, you know, what's new and what the plans for the future are. So uh, in terms of the overall uh, classes that I'm giving uh, this morning, uh, it's going to be just a, a lecture on these topics up above. This afternoon, starting at 1, uh, we'll just, it'll just be a demonstration where I sort of go through a lot of the, uh, the plugins in particular, um, but with a, with a real detector uh, demonstrating how to use it, which, you know, for people who are wanting to help people understand how to use it on a beam line and so on, I think you know, that, that can be useful. Tomorrow, the idea is it's, it's hands-on practice um, so that you will be, people who are in the class tomorrow, will be actually running uh, a detector, uh, probably a simulation detector, and actually going through these steps and you know, saving files and learning how to uh, configure the plugins to do real-time image processing and that sort of thing. Uh, and then next week, there'll be, the last two days next week, will be on, uh, you know, it, uh, aimed at people who want to be able to program area detector either to write a new driver or to write a new plugin or, you know, add a feature to a driver or a plugin uh, and so on. So the motivation for area detector, I think that uh, this is probably familiar to most of you that you know that two-dimensional detectors now and, and uh, you know, particularly in the last few years have become essential components of what we do on synchrotron beam lines. Uh, from sample viewing cameras to X-ray diffraction and scattering detectors, uh, X-ray imaging, optical spectroscopy, uh, all sorts of things where at the beamline we need to be able to use two-dimensional detectors. And of course, here at the APS, but many other places around the world, we need to be able to integrate control of those detectors with the EPICS control system. And you know that Epix is becoming very widely avail widely used at not just the APS but other synchrotrons. And as you'll see, area detector is growing now as a collaboration where there's real input from people at these other sites that are heavily using it, and of course have their own needs that they uh, want uh, taken into the the area detector product. Um, one thing that isn't always obvious is that you know you you can uh, you need to control the the being able to control a detector from epics can even be useful on beam lines that don't, don't otherwise use epics uh, that was true at a number of beam lines at NSLS for example where they were using spec to do all the hardware uh, talking to the beamline motors and so on, not going through epics, but they needed to talk to a detector and, and there wasn't a spec driver for that detector, so they just ran area detector, IOC, somewhere on the beamline, and of course spec knows how to talk to epics. So then they had control of epics, I mean control of the detectors uh, from a non-epics control system. Um, I think there are clear advantages to coming up with a framework or an architecture that can be used on any detector and then lets you reuse lots of the software components. And by, by putting Epix control on a detector, you basically let any high-level client control the detector and access the data, you know, Control System Studio or Spec or MEDM or Python or IDL. And the important thing there is the client only needs to know how to talk to Epix. It doesn't need to know anything about the details of a particular detector. In terms of the, the goals, 
Uh, the, the first is that we want to be able to provide detectors for, you know, drivers for as many detectors uh, as we can that are in used at the beam lines. And you'll see in a, in a few minutes, there is quite a list of available drivers now. Um, and we want to be able to handle, you know, very high performance uh, detectors within this framework. Um, and I'll talk a bit about how that's accomplished and sort of a, a way forward in the future where we could do things even faster than we do them at present. Um, we want to have a basic set of parameters that all detector drivers implement, if possible. Um, things like you know, exposure time and start acquisition and um, binning and sort of common parameters. Um, the advantage of doing that is that um, we can have generic clients uh, that don't necessarily know what detector they're talking to um, if they talk to this base set of properties. But we want to be able to, and we want to be able to make it uh, easy to implement a new detector. There's, right now, it's just a single C++ driver file that you have to write, which is basically epics independent. Um, meaning that it, use, it, 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 it uses a few features from Epix, uh, the, the libcom library from Epix base, which provides operating system independent things like threads and queues and so on. And it uses ASIN, which is one Epix module. But otherwise, it's, it's pretty much independent. You know, it doesn't depend um, at the driver level on things like the Epix database, uh, Epix records. The Epix records are just sort of a convenient way to talk to the driver. Uh, we want to make it easy to implement detector-specific features. So almost all detectors have some uh, unique properties that we need to be able to implement that's beyond the set of, that's in the base uh, base here. And it's, it's easy to do that. Uh, as I said, it's Epix independent at the lower layers. And then probably one of the, the most important features of the framework is that you have these things called plugins that run uh, at, at a middle level, I'll show on an architecture drawing, a diagram in a second, that have the capability to do things like regions of interest, uh, file saving, statistics, real-time image processing, and so on. The characteristic of these plugins is, first of all, they're device independent, so they work with any detector. So once you know how to use a particular plugin with a ProSilica camera, you also know how to use it with a Pilatus and uh, an ADSC or whatever kind of detector. Um, and these plugins run below the level of the Epix database and below channel access, so they have very high performance. You're basically passing pointers in memory. Um, and so you're, the, the overhead in running these is, is small. Okay, there are a, a few... Um, data structures that are used in area detector that um, it, it helps to know a little bit about them to understand how area detector works. The most important is uh, an object called an ND array, um, which simply means an n-dimensional array. Um, and one of the first talks that I gave in this room on area detector, I think it was Andrew, uh, Johnson, who suggested that uh, at that point it was a two-dimensional, uh, it was a two-dimensional driver. You know, it was aimed at two-dimensional data, and and generalizing it to n dimensions was was pretty easy, and really has opened up the capability of supporting things that are you know not just two-dimensional detectors. And I can name I'll name some in, in, at in some point in the talk. Um, so it right now it's there's a there's a uh, there's a a constant that's defined for the maximum number of dimensions, just to make things simple. So it's 10, which is probably plenty, uh, because we needed n-dimensional support um, even for two-dimensional detectors if they do color, right? Because color is going to be a third dimension in, in such detectors. The ND array is what plug-in callbacks receive from drivers. So the driver takes the data from the camera puts it into an object, this object, uh, 
and then passes a pointer to that object to these plugins. An ND array, um, and we'll take a look at uh, the definition in the header file in just a second, um, but it has attached to it a linked list of attributes, ND attributes. Um, and basically, these are metadata that you know, help to describe the ND array and are attached to it. And as the array goes through the processing pipeline, you know, from, one, from the driver to plug-in one, to plug-in two, to plug-in three, um, these attributes travel with it. Each plugin can add additional attributes to the array, like the processing plugin might add an attribute that says what it did to the data. Um, and these attributes can come from the driver parameters. Um, you know, the, the binning in the detector could be, a, 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 or, or the exposure time, those kinds of things, that it gets directly from the driver or from a plugin. Attributes can get their values from that. They can also get their value from any EPICS PV. So if you uh, assign an attribute, an EPICS PV, it puts a monitor on that PV, and every time it goes and gets the value of that attribute, it'll get the latest value of that EPICS PV. So now you know, your array can have associated with it the ring current and the positions of all the motors at the instant that it was collected. And, and that then travels through the pipeline with it. Also, uh, you now can define attributes that get their values from a, a C++ function that you write. So you can write your own function that basically it gets loaded at runtime and can define uh, attribute values if these two are not sufficient for what you're trying to do. Finally, in terms of these sort of high-level uh, structures, uh, there's something called an ND array pool it's basically a pool of these objects. So every time a driver wants to put data into an array, it goes and gets one from the pool. It passes those, that array to the plugins, and plugins, when they're passed a pointer to one of these arrays, must treat it as read-only data. They're not allowed to modify it because multiple plugins have been passed the same pointer. So you're not allowed to modify it. If a plugin is going to make a, do some modification on the array, make a new array, then it must make a copy. Um, so that, that's the only time you get the copy penalty is if you need to modify it. If you're just looking at the array, if a plugin is just looking at the array, there is no copy. Um, and the, every time a plugin gets an array, a reference count on the array is incremented. When the plugin is done with it, it's decremented. And once the reference count goes to zero, it's put back in the pool. So the, the advantage of this is there's not a lot of memory allocation going on. right? It, it gets allocated once. And then as long as the driver, when it goes and allocates one of these, gives a size such that it can find one that's big enough in the pool, it doesn't need to reallocate the memory. And that speeds things up. OK, so this is sort of the, oh, the overall architecture diagram of area detector. Let's start at the bottom. At the bottom is your, your detector, um, some hardware that you got from the vendor. Um, and uh, then the next layer above that is something else that you normally got from the vendor, um, which is how to talk to the hardware. This could be. Um, you know, a C library or a C++ library that the vendor gives you. It could be a socket protocol, you know, commands that you send to their socket server. Um, it could be a way that you take the vendor application, like the vendor may give you a high-level GUI application, but provide a way for you to automate that application from your code. Um, so some way or other, there's a way for for you to talk to the vendor's hardware through some software they provide. Um, the next layer above that is what is, is the area detector driver. Um, so this is what needs to be written for each new detector or detector family um, that we want to support in area detector. So this, this is written in C++. It inherits from a number of base classes below it. 
um, that take care of lots of the details of how to interface to ASIN, how to interface basically to Epic's records. Um, it, so, but the driver, you know, you, the, the guts of what needs to be done for your specific, to talk to, to, talk to your specific uh, vendor software is what's implemented in this driver. The driver, as I said, takes the images that it gets from the vendor API, puts them into these ND array structures, and passes them to all plugins, that's this level, that have registered for callbacks. So a plugin, um, when it's activated and, and it is told to get its data from the driver, registers for a callback, and every time the driver gets a new array, it calls this plugin which then does its processing on the array, and we'll get into the details of, of the different ways that that can be done. These then, uh, the plugins and the driver, are talking through standard ASIN device support um, to the Epix records up above. So up here you have records like binary output records that say, you know, turn the detector on and off, or um, on, analog output record or a long out that says what's the binning uh, supposed to be, and, and so on. So there's just a standard set of EPICS records here. All of those are using the standard ASIN device support, which itself is device independent. This, this comes with ASIN. This comes with area detector. And then, of course, at the level above that um, are the channel. So this is the IOC running, you know, uh, uh, serving these records over Epix channel access. Uh, so then up here we have the clients like MEDM or Python or ImageJ or Spec that are communicating uh, through these records. One of the records that's in, that's, that's in the database is going to be an Epix waveform record which can actually hold the image data. Now, Epic's waveform records in the uh, well, Epic's waveform records are lit, are uh, are one-dimensional arrays, um, which is you know doesn't map well to the what we're trying to do, uh, but it's what we have to live with. So the way that this is handled in Area Detector is you have to. You have to load a waveform record that's big enough to hold the biggest image that your detector or your plugins could produce um, and of the appropriate data type. Um, and then there are some additional records that are used to describe what is the structure of that waveform record really. You know, how many rows, how many columns, how many colors, and so on. So it's, it's, uh, it's stored in the waveform record as a one-dimensional array, but it's really an n-dimensional array. The client has to use these ancillary records to figure that out, what the real structure of the data is that it gets over channel access. And this is, you know, it's not a clean solution, but it's what we have to live with in Epix v3. Epix version 4 has the ability to put structured data on the network um, where an, a, an ND array can be properly described uh, and as an atomic object, right? You know, the problem with V3, and this isn't in practice a problem, but in principle could be a problem, is that if you have a PV that says, you know, this is NX and NY and here's the data, What's the order in which those update so, I, so I'm sure that it's a consistent set of data? Um, but you haven't changed the image before you changed NX or vice versa. In practice, it hasn't proven to be a problem, but it's certainly not a, a very clean solution. So this is the file ndarray.h, the header file that defines an ND array. So the first... Um, there's, there's a bunch of enums that I want to go through. Um, the first is an enumeration of the color modes that, you, that are supported in an ND array. So uh, the, the supported color modes are mono, which is you know, self-explanatory. There's only one, uh, you know, it's, there's only one color uh, 
per image. So that's, that's what most X-ray detectors would produce, is a mono image. Bayer is um, a monochromatic image, but each pixel has a different color filter in front of it. So this is what real color cameras actually produce, is, is a bare image, where one pixel's got a blue filter and a red, and two, they're, usually they're in groups of four, and there are two green pixels and a red and a, and a blue. Um, so you can say that that's the image that's coming across. Okay, then there are three RGB uh, uh, color modes. RGB1 means that the, it, it's called pixel interleave. So the, it, you know, at each, as, as you go through the array, it goes red, green, blue, red, green, blue for each pixel. RGB2 is a row interleave. So first you have the red row, then a green row, then a blue row. And then RGB3 is plain interleave. So you have all the red pixels, then all the green pixels, then all the blue pixels successive in memory. These are some uh, modes that cameras can produce where they pack multiple pixels into, uh, you know, so for instance, four bytes encodes, encodes two pixels, or six bytes encodes four RGB pixels. That's much less commonly used. And there's not a lot of support in area detector for these VUV modes. But there is some, because this is more efficient, right? You can send six bytes of data to hold four pixels. Uh, six bytes can encode four RGB pixels, which is normally four RGB pixels would take 12 bytes. So if, if your camera sends this across the network, you're using half the bandwidth. Um, and then often the vendor will give you in their library on the host code that would take this and convert it to RGB, which is more useful. Um, in terms of display clients and so on. But now you've saved network bandwidth at the expense of some CPU utilization on the host. This next uh, enumeration defines, if it's a bare image, what is the order of the bare pixels. Then there's a definition of a structure that defines a dimension. So we've got an n-dimensional array, and each dimension is characterized by a size, uh, an offset, so this could be an offset relative to the uh, original coordinate system of the detector. For instance, if, if you have a region of interest that's taking a part of the image, then you would encode here. The, uh, this encodes the offset of where that region of interest starts. Um, uh, binning that says, you know, it, what's the uh, pixel uh, summation relative to the original image? And then finally, a, a flag that says, is the image reversed in that dimension compared to the original image? This structure, I'm, we're not going to worry about here. This is basically you can go out and, and take an ND array and, and run a, a, a method on it that will return this structure that sort of populates information about the array like the stride, you know, how, if you want to get to the next pixel, how many elements do you have to skip because that depends on the color mode, for example. And it gives you the total size of the array and bytes and that sort of thing. So here's the uh, uh, ND array definition itself. Um, so these are the, the methods for this C++ uh, object. Um, you know, it's got a reserve and release have to do with this reference count that I was talking about. There's a report method, but there's not a lot of methods here. Um, what, there's some public data, um, but again, not a lot. So every uh, array um, has a pointer to the array pool object from which it was allocated, um, a number which is a unique ID. So typically, every time your camera collects a new image, this gets incremented. So that every frame is tagged with a unique number. So for instance, if you dropped some frames from your camera, you know which frames you dropped. Uh, has a timestamp, which is a double. But it, um, so that's very convenient. Clients can you know, plot doubles and so on. It also has an epics timestamp, which is a structure with uh, basically consisting of two 32-bit integers, uh, the nanoseconds and the seconds since epoch. Um, it has a, the number of dimensions in the array, an array of dimensions, a data type, a data size, and a pointer to the data, and then a pointer to this linked list of attributes.
It's unique to the camera. And it can be, depending on the driver, some cameras themselves produce that number inside so it comes along with the images. Um, if it doesn't, then the driver uh, typically you know, makes up that number. But it's not uh, yeah, globally unique. And then this is the methods for the ND array pool um, to you know, allocate something. You, typically, unless you're writing a driver, you don't need to worry about. This is the definition of, the, of an ND attribute. Um, where again, attributes have one of these uh, uh, data types. It, in ND arrays can have any of these data types. So they can be 8-bit sign, signed or unsigned 8, 16, or 32-bit integers, or 32 or 64-bit floats. So you know, it's, very, uh, it's very general. Arrays can have any of these data types. The array has just associated, you know, one of its properties is the data type. And a plugin might change the data type of an array. For instance, if it does normalization by a flat field, uh, and it might take an 8-bit image and turn it into a floating point image because it's now been you know, scaled. So on these uh, attributes, this is where, did the at where does the attribute get its data? I already went through that. You know, I could get it from a driver or from an FXPV or a function. Um, and that's probably, and then these are the methods for the attribute. Uh, Class. At present, and this is something that you know might be enhanced in the future. At present, attributes are uh, scalars, except that they can be strings of arbitrary length. So strings are supported, but other data types of arrays are not. If you change anything in the attribute list, you must then make a copy of the array because the other plugins might be looking at that attribute list, and if you modify it they would be hosed. Data itself is only in the waveform record, which gets populated by a plugin called ND standard arrays. So it depends where does that plugin get its data. If it's getting the data from t the plugin Tim just described that modified it, then that's the array that it'll get. Only plugin that knows about the waveform record data is the ND standard arrays plugin. All the, none of the other plugins directly make their data available to Epic's, make the array data available to Epic's records. That only goes through the standard arrays plugin, and that's typically only used, or I should say mostly used, by visualization clients, right? You know, it's the ImageJ or, or IDL that wants to display the images that's talking to that standard arrays plugin. Otherwise, you know, you don't, if you don't want to visualize your data, if all you want to do is stream it to disk, it never has to go into a waveform record, right? Because it's just going from the driver to, a, to some image processing plugins that preserve it as ND arrays, not as, as a waveform records, and then it goes to some file saving plugin that writes it to disk. So it never goes through a waveform record. You can have multiple ND uh, you know, standard arrays plugins in, in your configuration. So, you know, one of them could be populating the, could be converting the, making the raw data into a waveform record, and another one could be the processed data, and your client just switches, you know, which standard arrays uh, plugin is it looking at. Or you can have multiple clients, you know, one looking at this data and one looking at this data. And, yeah, you can even do that so that you have three drivers and one standard arrays plugin. So you have three cameras and, and only one, but only one of them can be viewed at a time. And I know they did this at the Australian Synchrotron, right? Because it, it, it didn't, it, that just happened to be, a, they only were able to use one camera at a time. So they just select which camera they're viewing and you reduce the complexity of the overall system because there's only one client and only needs to look at one thing. The way you tell it tell the driver what attributes it should load into that linked list, <clears throat> excuse me, is you generate an XML file. So you, you say, so every attribute has a name, which has to be unique, 
It has a, a type. Is it an epics PV or a driver parameter or a user written function? And then if and then depending on what its um, type is, you tell it, you know, what's the source of its data. So if this is an epics PV, and so it's getting its data from the ring current, the ring current engineering units, and you know the, the energy of the uh, sector 34 undulator or monochromator, whatever this is. Um, you know, so this is just a you build a file like this that defines um, where the attributes for that ND array, for that driver or plugin are going to come from. So it's pretty simple. Let me uh, talk just a little bit about sort of what's been going on recently because I don't, I don't believe I've given a talk on this. Um, so in, uh, before Area Detector 2.0, Area Detector was, first of all, it was part of Synapse um, and it was stored on the same subversion repository that the rest of the Synapse code, like motor and so on, were stored on. Um, and there were a couple of problems. Uh, first, it was getting too big because it was, it's a mon it was a monolithic package like Motor is, right? So every time, uh, it was hard to get out a new release because some driver was always not quite ready to be released. Um, and, you know, we were working on one driver, so it was being held up. Um, it also, the APS subversion repository is not a great mechanism for collaborating with people from other sites. Um, they, can, they can provide uh, access to people from elsewhere, but it's, in, it's inconvenient. And there are much better tools for doing collaborative development nowadays. So we decided to use um, Git as the, as the source code uh, management system and GitHub as the host, um, because these are now pretty popular for, uh, for doing multi-site collaborations. So the way uh, Area Detector is now organized as of release 2.0 is there's a top-level module that's called Area Detector. That um, is very similar to, for those who are familiar with Synapse, to the support module at the top level of Synapse. It basically doesn't have any code in it. It's just like the, org the, the top level make files and configure release files and that sort of thing. Under Area Detector are other modules, uh, the most important of which is called AD Core. Um, so this is where all of the base classes and the plugins and the simulation detector uh, and the documentation for all of this uh, reside. Um, and so this is the, the mod, this is a required module. You must have this to use area detector. There's another um, a sort of core module that's called AD binaries, but what we've done is uh, starting with Area Detector 2, we're only providing the pre-built binaries for Windows because building these things on Windows can be a major challenge. And so, you know, you, once you built a DLL, just let everybody use it. But on, and, and Windows is pretty good about having stuff work across multiple versions of the OS. Linux is not. Right? If I compile something on my uh, Fedora 15 system, if I build a shareable library on my Fedora 15 system, it's not going to run on your Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 system uh, because it uses a newer version of uh, uh, glibc. And so we don't do binaries for Linux anymore, only for Windows. Um, that's, that's not true in the individual detectors if the vendor gives you a lib file um, or a shareable object file, then we will provide that in here, but that will put constraints on what version of Linux you're allowed to use because that's whatever the vendor chose to support. You know, the vendor, if they give you a version, like for instance, Point Gray provides a shareable library uh, that won't work on enterprise Linux 6. So you can't run it on a standard APS Linux computer. Uh, it does happen to work on Fedora 15, which is what I'm using, but we'll, we'll get into a little more of those details. So each of these boxes here, 
including the top level one, is a separate Git repository. Um, that the nice thing about this, breaking it up like this, is that each of these can be released independently. So now, you know, when there's a new plugin available, we can release a new version of AD Core, even if we are not ready to release the new version of AD ProSilica, of the ProSilica driver, or the Pilatus driver, or any of the other drivers out on the, on the x-axis here. <clears throat> um, so it's all hosted here at http github.com area detector. If for those who are familiar with Git, each, each of these is, is what's called a Git submodule under this. Um, what that means is that if you do a Git clone minus minus recursive of area detector here, you will get all of these modules. Um, but you don't have to do that. You can, you know, you can clone this and then go to this directory and clone this, this, you know, whichever drivers you need, but you don't have to clone them all. Um, the only things you need are this plus this plus whatever driver you're interested in um, for your specific uh, detector. Okay, so the top level area detector um, ha has a configure directory and by default, this is the only place where you need to define the paths and versions of the supporting software like Epix Base and ASIN and if you're building IOCs, things like autosave and calc and so on. Um, so this, as I said, def contains a file that defines these submodules that you can clone with git clone minus minus recursive. Um, it, this contains a documentation directory that builds and installs all the documentation. And it contains a top level make file that you can run to build all of the modules like you would do at the top level of Synapse. If you just type make at the top level of Synapse, you know, you build everything in the right order so that, you know, dependencies are are obeyed. Even if you use make minus j to do a parallel build, they should all, it should all work. And that's, that's true here as well. But you don't have to use this top level make file. You can just go to the individual uh, modules that you want to build and build them manually. The dependencies are simple. You have to build binaries if you're running on Windows. Then you build core. And then it doesn't matter what order you build anything else. That, that area detector 2.0 is a bad name, right? I mean, what it really is is AD Core 2.0, right? I, I, so what, what we will have is um, AD Core will have releases, which are, you know, now 2.1 has come out and 2.2 is about to come out. The detector drivers will have their own versioning numbers, right? In fact, there might already be a version 2.2 of one of those drivers. And they'll follow sort of standard versioning numbering where if there's a breaking, you know, incompatible change, there'll be a major release. So, you know, there might be an AD Pilatus 3.0 when AD Core is still 2.3. The question is, does the top level of area detector get uh, a name? And what we've decided to do, I believe, at the last meeting at Diamond was to do like it's done for some Linux projects, basically give it a, a release that's just a date. It, it, it won't have a number, but it'll say, you know, here, if you get this top level, that's the December 15th, 2014 release. The drivers, I would just number the drivers as, as if they're completely independent of AD Core. You know, start with 1.1 one, one and whatever. I mean, I think we started them all with two to something just to make it clear that these were now from the new art they needed the new architecture the new layout i should say okay and i mentioned this um, briefly before so uh, and when it, i'm now going to talk about drivers and there's really three different types of drivers and if you're writing a new one the the best thing to do is to find one that's using the same mechanism of as the one that you want to write so there's kind of three models. The, the, the most common probably is that the vendor provides a C or C++ library um, that you call to control the detector. Uh, the next most common is that the, ven that the vendor just gives you a socket uh, server and some definition of the socket protocol, and that's how you talk to the detector over sockets. And then finally, there are a few examples where uh, the vendor gives you an application program and some way to automate that. So they give you a, a user interface, a GUI, which you can interact with directly, but you can also automate that application from your own code.
And there are right now, I think, two examples of that. Um, so right now, I think I counted that there are 23 different drivers in area detector. Um, and there's many more cameras, detectors supported than that because some of these are quite generic and they would support detectors from a variety of manufacturers. Uh, so the first one is, is called AD driver. It's part of AD core and it's the base class from which all other detectors derive. So when you write a new driver, you, in, you, you uh, inherit from this uh, base class. So this handles the details of the EPIX interfaces and other common functions. This itself inherits from a driver called ASIN ND array driver, which inherits from ASIN port driver. So there's a couple of classes below this, um, but this is the only one you need to worry about when you're writing a new driver. That's not quite true. You need to worry about its base classes as well, because you'll be calling its base class, the, the, the ASIN port driver functions directly. Um, there is in AD core a simulation driver that produces calculated images and depending on your computer it can do that at very high rates. Um, and it implements nearly all of the basic parameters that I talked about including all the data types, color, and so on. So it's useful as a model for real detector drivers and it's also very useful for testing plugins and clients. You know, when you don't have a real detector available, you can just run the sim detector and see if your plugin works. Okay, then I'll go through quickly just through the real drivers. Uh, the ProSilica was, I think, the first one that was written. Um, so this is for gigabit Ethernet cameras, mono and color. Um, high resolution, high speed. This is, this is one of them that I'll be using for the demonstration this afternoon. Uh, and this is one of the examples where uh, it's, you control it by calling uh, a vendor C library that's called, in this case, PVAPI. Um, it's, there's support for uh, basically any vendor's FireWire cameras that follow this IEEE 1396 DCAM specification. Um, and there's two separate drivers, one for Windows and one for Linux. Um, the one on Windows is based upon a, a public domain driver from Carnegie Mellon, and the one on Windows is based upon the, I'm sorry, the one on Linux is based upon uh, open source uh, uh, DCAM libraries on, on Linux. Firewire cameras, on the other hand, are, I mean, they're becoming obsolete. You know, their Firewire is not the preferred uh, interface for cameras anymore. It's not fast enough, <clears throat> and most vendors are, uh, are not actively developing new FireWire cameras. But it was one of the first digital camera uh, interfaces that was supported. Uh, there's a driver for, it's called Roper driver for Princeton Instruments cameras and Photometrics cameras, and this is one of the examples of controlling a vendor application. So there's a vendor application that you get from Princeton Instruments called WinView. It can be automated by the Microsoft uh, COM uh, mechanism, co component object model, I think that stands for. Um, and so we've used that a lot in the past for controlling these cameras. You can also control almost all those same cameras by another driver that's called the PV cam driver. This uses, instead of automating an application, uh, going through a vendor C library that's called PV cam. Uh, and the advantage of this is that, at least in principle, it should work on Linux. I don't know uh, very many people, if, if anybody's actually gotten that to work, um, but I think with a, little, with a little work, it could be made to work. Um, the, uh, then there's the driver that probably many of you are familiar with for the Pilatus uh, pixel array detectors, and this is an example of one that uses sockets to the vendor's uh, cam server application. And this is you know, a case where it's, it's really, not a great architecture that they've come up with because they provide no way for an area detector driver to directly get the data from the detector. So the detector has to write a disk file, a TIFF file, and then area detector reads back the TIFF file to get the data into the ND array so that you can run it through the plugins and visualize it and so on. Uh, it's kind of ugly, but that's what we have. Uh, 
There's a Mars CCD driver. It actually has exactly the same problem. Uh, it's just socket communication to their Mars CCD program running in remote control mode. Again, they don't provide a way to send the data, so you have to write a file and read it back. There's a driver for the ADSC uh, detectors, and right, this was written by Lewis Muir at IMCA, and it hasn't been, uh, it only provides control, so there's no way to get the data back in this driver. I mean, if somebody wanted to do that, I think it's possible, it's just he didn't need it for his application, so it hasn't been written. There's a driver for the MAR 345 image plates. Again, that's a socket. Uh, communication to the MAR 345 DTB socket server. Same issue with uh, it just writes disk files that are read back uh, into area detector. There's a driver for the Perkin-Elmer flat amorphous uh, flat panel uh, detectors um, that are uh, pretty widely used here at the APS. And that's controlled by C calls to the vendor library. Driver for Bruker cameras. Uh, CCD cameras, they have a, Br a Bruker instrument server, uh, socket server, that does provide direct access to the data over the socket. Uh, there's a driver for Princeton's, this is kind of the follow-on to the Roper driver that used WinView automation. Uh, WinView has been replaced by Princeton Instruments with a, a new application called Lightfield um, which can run their new detectors. Uh, the WinView program can't run some of the newer Princeton instrument detectors. And this is a 64-bit application. Again, it's a Windows-only application. It's a 64-bit application. They have a, um, a way to automate that uh, using what Microsoft calls a common language runtime. I think this is written in C Sharp, but, but the C Sharp objects can be controlled from C++. So we can, we can run this from ethics. We're using this on our beam line. Uh, there's a new driver that John Hammonds uh, is currently working on that uses uh, the, sort of the replacement for PV cam is now called PI cam. It's just for Princeton instrument cameras, not for photometrics cameras. And um, uh, so that provides a way to talk to all the new Princeton instrument cameras without having to use light field so directly through a library. The disadvantage of Lightfield is I think it does cost like $4,000 or something just to buy the software. Um, and this is 64-bit, okay, right. Um, there's a driver for the Photonic Sciences Limited PSL cameras. Um, these are, there's, I don't think they're very, there's maybe one or two of these at the APS, but they're pretty popular, particularly at Diamond. Um, so that's controlled via a socket connection to, they have a Python server, a Python socket server that you talk to um, to control these cameras. There's a driver called a URL driver, so that lets you get images from any URL. Um, so it works with web cameras, access video servers, static images, you know, you could just point it to a disk file. Um, but maybe that disk file is being updated by something. And this is all done by calls to the Graphics Magic Library, which is a popular open source imaging library for Linux and Windows. There's a driver for the Andor cameras. They're CCD cameras. Uh, that's based upon version 2 of their C software development kit. And then a driver for the Andor 3 cameras, which are their scientific CMOS cameras. There's one of these on sector 32. Um, there may be some more uh, around. And this is the next version of their SDK for driving uh, these cameras. Uh, there's a driver that I've written relatively recently for all cameras from a company called Point Grey in uh, Canada. So this is Gigi cameras, USB 3 cameras, USB 2, Firewire. Again, they give a C uh, software development kit to do that programming. Uh, driver for the Pixie Rad, that's the, the cadmium telluride pixel array detector that, so this is, they, they, their camera um, has a fairly complex TCP and UDP communication that you use to talk, to control it and get the data, and that's how uh, the communication with that is done. 
There's, and this is something that people should be aware of. I don't think it's being used very much here at the APS, but it's being used a lot at Diamond and I think at Brookhaven too, um, which is a generic driver for giggy cameras. Um, it, it should work with any giggy vision compliant camera. Giggy vision is an industry standard for uh, gigabit ethernet cameras. Uh, Unfortunately, the gigabit ethernet standard is proprietary. So you, you, you can't actually get the standard unless you join the consortium. So uh, somebody uh, reverse engineered that library um, and it's, it's a Unix package called Erevis. And so this is a driver that uses that reverse engineered Linux library uh, to talk to Giggy cameras. And the Giggy vision, I mean, it's a very clever thing what they do. On the camera, on every Giggy Vision camera, is an XML file inside the camera that describes all the properties of that camera and how to access them. So, you know, this goes in, you read that XML file, and then what Tom Cobb has written, and, and I've used this, it works well, is that he goes, reads that XML file, from that generates a template, a, you know, an Epix database that has all the parameters that that camera supports and generates the EDM screen to display it. So it's all generated from a Python script. Um, so it's, it's quite nice and I used it on, on a camera that uh, Brookhaven bought. It's, a, it's one of these ones from Photonic Sciences but instead of using their Python library, because it's a Gigi Vision camera, we could directly use this driver. Linux only, but. It looks, it looks pretty nice. And what we should do is to take Tom's Python script that generates EDM displays and, you know, massage it so it generates MEDM displays. Uh, and because, you know, even if you're not, because from MEDM we can make anything, <laughs> right? We can make CSS boy and we can make, uh, we can make CAQTDM displays out of that. Uh, there's a new driver that uh, Arthur uh, Glowacki from here at the APS has written for the Q imaging cameras. And then there's a driver <coughs> that is still in beta, I would say, um, that is a driver that receives ND arrays over Epix V4 on the network. So, this has to work in companion with something that I'll mention in a minute, which is you've got your camera IOC running on this machine. And there's a plug-in that goes with this, it's in the same package, that takes the ND arrays, converts them into Epix V4 data structures, and puts them out on the network. This is a driver that receives those and publishes them as ND arrays in an IOC on a remote machine. So now this is a way of having a driver uh, collecting data and having plugins that operate on that data across multiple machines. Right now, the way it's written, unless you use this mechanism with V4, is you can use multiple cores in a particular machine, but it's one process with multiple cores. This lets you spread out your plugins across multiple processors in multiple uh, pr processes on multiple machines. And he demonstrated, you know, saturating 10 gigabit Ethernet with this data, so the, 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 and, and, and in, including compressing it. So taking ND arrays, compressing them, and putting them out over 10 gigabit ethernet and saturating 10 gigabit ethernet. So performance is, is pretty good. So this is uh, the, uh, I, I was saying that because we have this base class of parameters, um, we can write generic clients. This is just a generic MEDM screen that's called adbase.adl. Um, and with this screen, you should be able to control any camera. You won't be able to control all the features of any camera, but you could probably basically make any camera work with this screen. Um, but most, most of the time, you wouldn't use this screen because it may display parameters that are not relevant to your detector, and then of course it wouldn't display parameters that are relevant to your detector, that are unique to your detector, specific. And then there are 
you know, screens. The, this is an example of, of a specific screen. This is the one for controlling the Pilatus uh, detector where it has things like the energy threshold. You remember in the Pilatus you can set, it's a discriminator. So this is the level of the, of the discriminator and uh, you know, some temperature and humidity readouts of the device. This is all the stuff that's specific um, to the device. So some of these, like the acquire period and the exposure time, those are the base class generic uh, parameters, but there's something called a delay time here, which is not you know, a generic parameter. It's a specific parameter to the Pilatus. And um, this is where you control where the where CAM server, the Pilatus uh, uh, vendor software, will save the images, um, but it's also where the area detector is going to read those images back. And you know you have the complication that if this is a socket server, so it could be that the area detector IOC is running on the same computer as CAM server. If it is, there's no problem with the path. Right, the path, because it, they're running on the same machine, the path that's valid for cam server is going to be valid for area detector. But if these are running on two different machines, then you have to you know, play some game with soft links or whatever to make it so that the path as seen by area detector is the same as the path that's seen by, uh, by the cam server. So this is the MAR 345. A specific screen, so just, you know, there's a different set of parameters, the specific parameters here. We try to do as best we can to make it so, you know, the file saving stuff might be slightly different for some reason because this, you know, they have a way of numbering files that uh, is, is uh, hard coded into uh, the MAR 345 server. We try to make this so that um, it, it looks the same no matter what detector you're using. This is the, an example of that one I called the light field drive, the light field driver. So this is the light field program from Princeton Instruments. And it's, you know, it's a very nice Windows GUI. It's got ways of setting up timing and triggering. Here, you know, it's, this is a, uh, uh, an image intensifier, you know, that's got very high speed uh, gating capabilities and complex gating capabilities. And you can set that all up graphically here. Um, so that was kind of the mot motivation I had. And you can also control the spectrum. This is, we're using this for visible light spectroscopy. Um, and it's got a spectrometer associated with it. Light field knows how to control not just the detector, but also the spectrometer. So if I automate light field, I get spectrometer control for free. And this is just, you know, if I do want to control all that timing stuff from Epix instead of with the GUI, um, you know, this is where I have to enter all those timing parameters. This is just an example of the URL driver where you can have, define a bunch of URLs and switch between them conveniently. So this is, you know, using some access cameras in our hutch, um, uh, some images that were coming off of a Mars CCD camera into a file system and so on. So this is the screenshot of the Andor driver that, that's being used on a number of beam lines here at the APS. Every, whenever we can, we try to write the drivers so that they'll run on both Windows and uh, Linux. And that's the case here. And in fact, it runs on both 32 and 64-bit versions of Linux and Windows. Perkin Elmer uh, flat panel uh, driver control. And you know, this has things where you know, the vendor provides, uh, uh, this is a, a, de a detector that tends to drift fairly, quick, fairly quickly with time so that you need to correct, collect a correction image fairly frequently. So we've got the ability to acquire these offset corrections. Um, and you, know, you could write a high level script that does this every N uh, exposures or something. This is, I'm just going to say a few words about the new driver that I wrote for the point gray cameras. Um, so as I said, it, this, this runs on both Linux and Windows. Um, and uh, it runs FireWire, Gigi, and USB 3 cameras. And the nice thing about these is that they're quite low cost um, for their performance. 
So this is a gig -E camera called the Blackfly. So it's got a, a CMOS sensor, global shutter. It's, it's teeny. It's like you know a cubic inch. Um, gets, gets power over Ethernet. Um, it's 16, 20 by 1200 pixels, color or mono. And it'll do 47 frames a second at this rate, which is very close to you know, saturating gig E. And it's only $600. So it's like five times cheaper than, the, than this camera, for example, which was closer to $3,000. And the camera that, uh, I talked about this actually at the Twig, so some of you may have heard this, but this is a, a CMOS camera that's got really high performance. So it's, it's a, you know, a couple megapixels. It's uh, got a 73 decibel dynamic range very high quantum efficiency, and the read noise is only seven electrons, which is comparable to you know, cooled CCD cameras. And um, it can do 162 frames a second. Um, and, and that works out to something like 360 megabytes a second, which is like three times faster than you can do over gigabit Ethernet um, with this USB 3 interface, and it's $1,300. So this is the camera I'm actually using to do all the tomography at Sector 13 now. I originally bought it to do pink beam tomography because you know this is going to go in a high radiation environment, and at $1,300 I could afford to replace it pretty often. Um, but it produces high, high enough quality data at high performance that we use it for the monochromatic beam now uh, as well. Yeah, there, I think ProSilica now makes a camera. Um, based on this, or it's now called AVT, Allied Vision Technology, makes a camera based on this same chip that's Gig E. Uh, but, but of course, you can't get the full performance of this chip over Gig E. It, it can't handle it. Um, but, it's, but it's, in some sense, more convenient uh, to use Gig E than USB. Although, I, I've been able to put a 20-meter active extender cable on this um, so I can run it from a computer outside the hutch. You know, 20 meters is long enough to get it in the hutch, and I only lost a few percent on the performance by doing that. And then this is the, the screen to control any point gray camera. Specific, you know, it can work with the Gigi or the USB camera, and they, they sort of use the old Firewire model that you have these different properties uh, that you control that are generic. Um, and then I change this screen so that if a property is not available, it hides it on the MEDM screen so you don't get overwhelmed with irrelevant information. OK, go on to talk about plugins. So plugins are, are uh, designed to perform real-time processing of the data, running in the IOC, but not over channel access. So we saw they receive ND array data over callbacks from drivers or from another plugin. And the plugins, this is, this is a really important concept. So the plugins can execute in their own threads, um, which, which I call non blocking, or in the callback thread. In other words, the thread that called that plugin, it can run in that thread. That's what we call blocking mode. So if it's running in the non blocking mode, then the ND array data is put into a queue. So the, the, the driver that's providing the arrays calls the plugin, and if it's operating in the non-blocking mode, there has to be a queue of images, and it just puts an image into the queue, and then the plugin that's running in its own thread takes the next image off the queue, does its thing with it, goes and gets the next image, and so on. Uh, obviously, if the plugin is not able to keep up, at the rate at which frames are being put into the queue, then you can drop images. But the advantage is that you've now got your driver running in one thread and your plug-in running in another thread. So they're using multiple cores on a, on a, C, on a modern CPU that has multiple cores. And so you can you know, really get all the cores in your machine running, uh, running flat out. And <clears throat> the advantage is that if you run it in the non-blocking mode, if one plugin can't keep up, but maybe it's just doing something um, that it's okay if it drops images, you know, so 
so some image processing to display a processed image for you. You don't care if you miss a few, but simultaneously the data unprocessed can be going to your disk file writer, which is streaming it to disk and not dropping any frames. If you're executing in the callback thread, then there's no queuing, so you can't drop images here, but of course it's slowing down the driver because the driver's now waiting for the plugin to do its processing, and so you may lose images at a lower level because the driver was not ready for the next frame that came from the hardware. All plugins allow you know, enabling it or disabling it, so you can just turn it off and on. You can throttle the rate so if you get a callback, but a certain delta time has not elapsed since the last time you got a callback, you can just ignore it. The plugin can ignore it. So you can throttle the rate. So even you know, your detector is producing 300 images a second, but you really don't need your you know, ImageJ client to display 300 frames a second. So you can just throttle the plugin that's producing those EPIX waveform data to only run at 10 hertz. And, you know, save yourself network bandwidth and CPU cycles. And you can also change dynamically at runtime where the data for that plugin is coming from. So it can become, you know, you can switch it from getting its data from the driver to another plugin. And, and it follows that some plugins are also sources of these ND arrays as well as consumers. So, the way, uh, for instance, there's a statistics plugin, and it's just a consumer of arrays. So it gets the arrays, produces some statistics, produces new PVs that, that are those statistics values, but it doesn't produce a new array. But the region of interest plugin or the processing plugin produce new arrays as well. So you can create here a data processing pipeline that runs at very high speed. Each plugin is running in a different thread and hence using multiple cores on most modern computers. Okay, so this is, these are the plugins that, um, that exist. Standard Arrays is a very simple plugin, as you'll see. So it just gets the ND arrays from the drivers and converts to standard EPIX arrays, i.e. waveform records. And so if a channel acts as viewer, that's, this is the plugin that it that it uh, connects to. And in fact, it's the only thing that the image J <clears throat> needs to talk to uh, to display the images is this plugin. It doesn't need to know about the driver or any of the other plugins. There's a region of interest plugin that selects a subregion from the image. It can optionally bin in any direction, reverse the order in any direction. So, you know, it could flip your image left, right, up, down. Uh, and convert the data type. Um, it can divide the array by a scale factor, um, which is, so let's say you're binning two, you've got eight bit images and you bin them two by two. You're now taking four pix, summing four pixels and making one new super pixel. That could overflow if you keep at eight bit. But it'll do the calculation in double and at the end divide by a user defined scale factor so you can get yourself back to eight bits. So in that case, you just divide by four and you'd be back to eight bit data where you couldn't have overflowed. Uh, there's a color conversion uh, plugin that can convert from one color model to another. So, you know, it could convert from mono to RGB1 or vice versa. It, it used to be able to do conversion from bare color to uh, RGB, but though I don't have any public domain code that does that, um, so, but I do have code in the ProSilica library and in the Point Gray library. They provide code that does that. So now those cam it's done in those camera drivers, not in the plugin, because I wanted to make the plugin independent of uh, ProSilica or Point Grey drivers. The, uh, there's a, a plugin transform that, I mean, sorry, a, a transform plugin that performs geometric operations, rotate, mirror, and X and Y, and so on. Statistics plugin, can, which can calculate a variety of different statistics. So there's basic statistics, you know, min, max, sigma, um, it can optionally compute a centroid position with a width and a tilt. Uh, 
Uh, it can optionally compute profiles through the data, including, say, the average X and Y profile, the profile at a user-defined cursor position. Um, it can also compute the image histogram and the image entropy, which is, a, which is a figure of merit of the quality of the image that's derived from the histogram. Uh, there's a processing plugin that's very powerful. So it can do uh, you know, arithmetic processing, background subtraction, flat field normalization, offset and scale, high and low clipping, recursive filtering in the time domain. That's the, the powerful part. And um, it also does conversion optionally to an out, a different output data type. There's an overlay uh, plugin which adds graphics overlays to an image. So you can use it to display, for instance, where your regions of interest are in the big image. Uh, you can have cursors, user-defined boxes. A recent addition from Keith Brister um, here at LSCAD is that you can display text uh, in an overlay. Here's some recent uh, additions to the plugins. So the one I was just referring to is this ND plugin circular buffer. So this is a plugin where it receives arrays and puts them into a circular buffer, you know, so that after some time it, it's overwriting the arrays in that buffer. But then when it receives a trigger, which could either be a, a PV that you write to that just says trigger, or some ND array attribute that indicates this array, you know, when you get this array, You've, you've been triggered, then um, it, it will, at that point, output however many pre-trigger arrays you've defined, and then after it gets the trigger, as many post-trigger arrays as you've defined. So, you know, if you think there's something going on on your beamline that's producing, you know, a dark image once every few seconds, you could set up a trigger um, that would, uh, you know, you run it through get some statistics on it or something and set up a trigger and it would, it would capture, a, you know, and tell you what was going on before and after that. Um, but this might be able to do what you were asking about, John. So, so you know, you could, um, you've, you've basically got another way of buffering the data here in a circular buffer. Uh, there's a new plugin that, um, and this was written by Alan Greer at Observatory Sciences. Matt Pearson wrote one, a fairly simple one. So this lets you, um, take one of those attributes that's attached to the ND array and display it as an epics PV. So, you know, you can see the value of that attribute and publish it both as a scalar and as an array. So you can get a time series of the value of some attribute. There's a new uh, um, plugin that Keith Brister just wrote that does edge detection uh, using uh, the, the canny function from the OpenCV uh, library. A new plugin that Matt Pearson wrote. Actually, this is kind of, rev of a reversion to the original version of the region of interest plugin. When I first wrote the region of interest plugin, it had two features. It could do multiple regions of interest, and it could do basic statistics. There, there was no statistics plugin at that point. Um, what we've been doing since then is, you know, take a region of interest plugin and then chain it to a statistics plugin. And that works fine when there's only a few, you know, one or a few regions of interest. But if there are many regions of interest, that's not an efficient way to do it, to have so many plugins all chained together. Um, so uh, this computes basic, simple statistics on multiple regions of interest in a single plugin. Um, <clears throat> there's uh, something that, again, is used a lot at Diamond, and I don't know that it's being used here yet, but it really should be. So this is a plugin that um, uh, is an MJPEG server. So it takes the images that ND array, uncompressed arrays that come in, and uh, puts it out as an MJPEG stream. So now you can view the images in any web browser. And the advantage here is that it's putting compressed images on the network instead of uncompressed images. So now this is something where it's then fine to have multiple computers at the beamline that are looking at the same images, even if they're coming in at pretty high rates. 
um, because they're compressed. Um, it also has a, has a, a mode where instead of writing it as in, 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 in exporting the data as a web stream or an MJPEG stream on the network, it'll write it to a disk file. So you can be streaming compressed video to a disk file. Um, this is um, the one I, I mentioned. I've already described this. So this is the companion plugin that takes the ND arrays and puts them out over Epix V4 uh, so that you can spread out your plugins to run on multiple machines. There's a, a set of what I call common plugins that are typically loaded in, in area detector in each of those modules. And I should describe this too. In the, in the each module, like let's say the Pilatus, has two branches at the very top level. Uh, for every detector, this is true. There's one where is the code for the driver, and all it does is build the library, and all it depends on is Epic's base and ASIN. Then there's another branch that's called IOCs that builds an example IOC. Um, and, you know, a real Epix application. And that depends not just on um, ASIN and Epix base, but it also depends on autosave and calc and, you know, the other things that we typically want to make a useful uh, IOC. And uh, in each of those, and, and often, with area detector, that's what many of you will run, right? Because you could take area detector and build it into your own IOC and add other features to it. But often, the features that come in the example IOC with area detector are sufficient, and you just run that. Um, but in there, I've defined you know, a command file and an MEDM screen or set of MEDM screens um, and that, that load a certain set of plugins. There's nothing magic about this. You know, we could have chosen some other, I mean, you always are gonna want a standard arrays plugin so you can export the data to some viewer and, a, and it's got a processing plugin and a transform plugin and a couple of color convert plugins and an overlay plugin and four region of interest plugins and five statistics plugins and one each of the file writing plugins. But if you wanted two standard arrays plugins, you can easily do that. You just modify the script, but then you got to work on the MEDM screen because there's not, you know, here there's only, it's only showing you one of the standard arrays plugins. So you'd have to customize your, your MEDM display as well. So this shows you at a, at a glance all of the plugins that are loaded in the, the, the example IOC here. So for each one, let's look at the, at the first row here. It tells you the port. That tells you where is this plugin getting its data, which ASIN port driver. And SIM1 is the name of the driver port. In other words, that, this means it's getting its data directly from the driver. But if I instead replaced SIM1 there with ROI1, the string ROI1, then this plugin would not be getting its data directly from the driver, it would be getting it from the first region of interest. Or I could replace it with PROC1 and it would be getting its data from the processing plugin and so on. So each of these uh, ROIs can be getting its data from their driver or from, I'm sorry, each of these plugins can be getting its data either from the driver or from any of the other plugins which are sources of arrays. You can't get it from the statistics plugin because the statistics plugin doesn't produce new arrays. Okay, so then for each uh, plugin, you, you have a flag that says, is it enabled or disabled? And then a flag that says, is it blocking or not blocking? So that remember that says, is it, if it's not blocking, it's using a queue. This tells you how many, how many frames have been dropped from the queue since it was last reset. And this tells you the number of free elements in the queue. So none of the plugins, well, the, the Statistics 5 plugin has dropped 885 frames. It's, um, and it's got zero free elements in the queue, meaning that it's, um, it's not able to keep up. 
In fact, you can see these plugins here are getting uh, are running at 89 frames a second, and this one is running at 21 frames a second. So the, the detector is producing data at 89 frames a second. These are keeping up, but this is not keeping up. It's only able to do 21 frames a second, so it's falling behind and, and it's dropping frames from the queue. You can, you can make it run for longer before it drops frames by making the queue bigger. Right here, all the queue except the first, except this one, were 20 elements. You could make them 2,000 elements, and then it'll run for longer, but eventually it's going to overflow the queue. But, but 2,000 might be enough. I mean, I, I do exactly this with the fast tomography. I'm collecting, let's say, 2,000 images, and I make the queue 2,000 frames. The detector runs flat out. If the file plugin can't keep up, that's okay. All the, elem all the frames do arrive in the queue, and a few seconds later, they'll all be written to disk. The experiment got done quickly, but the file writing took a few seconds longer to complete. You have to have enough memory to do that, but it doesn't allocate the memory in advance. It only allocates the memory you know, on demand. Stats 5, look at where it's getting its data. Uh, so stats 1 through 4 are getting their data from ROI 1 through 4. Stats 5, it's getting its data from SIM 1. In other words, from the whole detector. And, and so it's computing the statistics on the entire detector. And, and I've, you know, in this case, when I was making the slide, I deliberately sort of turned on all the processing that that statistics plugin could do to make it suck up CQ, CPU cycles to, to demonstrate this phenomenon here. Although it's not hard to do, I mean, it, the, the the calculations are pretty can be pretty involved, and it it can't keep up. But this is no, well, you can't see on this screen how big these images are. Um, so I don't know how many megabytes a second this is, but certainly on the on the SIM detector, we can run it at data rates that are, you know, approaching a gigabyte a second, and. Um, you know, some plugins can keep up at that rate, some plugins can't. This, uh, the, the simplest example, this is the standard arrays plugin, and in fact, everything you want see on this screen is replicated on all the other plugin screens because this doesn't do anything that's not in the plugin base class. So this is the name of it, the, its ASIN port. In a, we're not, we have, sort of assuming no knowledge of ASIN here, because that class isn't until next week. But suffice it to say that every driver and every plugin, they are what's called ASIN port drivers, and they're identified by name. So it's just a string, and this is the name of, the, of this port. This is the name of the ASIN port where it's getting its data. So SIM1, the whole detector. You can have, uh, ASIN also has an, an address, an integer address. Um, and you can use that to specify, you know, sort of a, a sub-address of this driver. Most drivers and most plugins don't use a sub-address. They only have one address. But for instance, that uh, ND plugin ROI stat that I mentioned, the one that does multiple regions of interest, you would identify the, the specific region of interest you're interested in from this address. Um, the enable or disable this plugin. This is the minimum time between processing on this plugin. So if it's zero, there's no limit. It just goes as it tries to keep up with the rate the arrays are coming in. But if you put this to 0.1 second, then it, at the fastest it would run is 10 hertz. This is where you set whether the callbacks block or not. So if no, then it uses the queue. Uh, yes, then this, the code of this callback runs in the callback thread. Uh, this is the size of the queue, which is set at IOC init. You know, you set that in your startup script, you can't change it after that. This is the number of elements in the queue that are free. This is uh, the, an array counter. So basically just something that every time it gets a callback, this number gets incremented. But if you type enter in this field, it'll reset it back to zero. Um, this is the rate at which it's currently processing callbacks, so 48 frames a second, how many frames it's dropped, and again, if you type enter in the field here with zero, you can reset that counter. So you know, you're trying to do some experiment to see 
am I dropping frames or not? Um, instead of having to remember what this number used to be, you just put press, you know, set it back to zero. Uh, and then this is displaying information about the last frame that was received. How many dimensions? What are those dimensions? Uh, what's the data type? What's the color mode? Bear pattern? Um, the unique ID? And this is that floating point timestamp from the ND array. And then here is where you could enter an attributes, the name of an attributes file, that XML file that I showed you, that um, would be used to add additional information in this plugin. In the case of the standard arrays plugin, that's useless because the standard, that would only be used to add attributes that a new array that this plugin produced would contain. But this plugin doesn't produce any new arrays, so this is not useful. But if this was a region of interest plugin, you know, you could put a file here and that would uh, populate additional attributes beyond those that were attached to the array when it received it. So it can add new elements to the. So this is the region of interest plugin. And you'll see in all these plugins, everything on the left hand side here is identical to what we just went through. So the stuff that's different for each plugin is what's on the right here. So <clears throat> for the region of interest plugin, you can you know, say, if you say data type automatic, that means the output data type will be the same as the input data type. Uh, but you could force it to be float. Um, you can say, do you want to enable a scaling? Um, and this is the scale divisor if you do. Uh, and it can be a floating point uh, number. And then for each dimension, you can enable that you know processing in that dimension um, or disable it um, so you you can set a binning you can set a the, the start pixel of the region of interest the size of the region of interest um, you can set whether it's reversed or not and then this is telling you how big the output uh, image from that region of interest in that dimension is this array counter the unique id comes with the array so that, was, that, that originated in the original driver. This counter is specific to this plugin. So it's just measuring how many callbacks have I gotten since the last time I set this to zero. The statistics plugin, so you, you, there are what, one, there's a bunch of different statistics that you can individually enable. So your basic statistics, the minimum, maximum, total, mean, sigma, um, the pixel where you, the pixel uh, x and y coordinates of the maximum and the pixel x and y coordinates of the minimum. Um, and, <clears throat> uh, and the net counts here is a background width. So you know, it sort of draws a box around your image that's this many pixels wide, takes the average counts in that box and says that's the background and then subtracts that from everything to give you the net counts. Simple background subtraction. Uh, the centroid uh, calculation you know, computes the centroid of in x and y, um, and the sigma and sigma xy, which is like the tilt of the ellipse. Then for each parameter, you can, um, you can, you can collect a time series of these statistics. So, you know, let's say your detector is producing 300 frames a second and, you know, you'd like to see, you know, what's the total counts as a function of time. So you can define here how many points you want to collect in time and then say go and then it'll collect all the statistics that are being uh, produced as a, as a time series and then at the end, um, you know, you can read that out. That's a waveform record, so you can read that out. So it provides a way, you know, much fa faster than you could keep up with the scan record, for example, for collecting that data. Then you can compute uh, profiles in uh, X and Y, and there are different types of profiles. As I said, you can get the average X profile, a specific row or column, and then you can compute a histogram, so you can tell it how many bins in your histogram and what's the minimum and maximum intensity that you want over that range of, of histogram bins. Uh, this number is the entropy, which is basically a measure of the sharpness of the histogram. 
So it can sometimes help if you're trying to focus. You know, if you want to do autofocus, this number ought to get smaller uh, as the focus improves. You know, the, the, the histogram gets sharper. You know, the, the thing is, if you've got the C code to do that operation, packaging it into a plugin is not hard. You know, if you don't have the C code, then you know, getting that, getting the algorithm is the hard part. Packaging it into a plugin is pretty easy. But there may be a library. You know, if there's a C library out there that does it, then that's exactly what uh, Keith Brister just did with that edge detection, right? He didn't write an edge detector. He just found the OpenCV library and exposed one of the functions in the OpenCV library as an area detector uh, plugin. Okay, so this is showing you the col you know, the, say the, uh, this is uh, um, the histogram. Uh, this is row and column profiles. This is time series of total counts and time series of the centroid. The overlay uh, plugin lets you add graphics overlays, and there there can be the uh, this plugin can do any can do any number of overlays. Um, I think you know out of the box it's configured to do seven. I mean that's what the or eight rather that's what the MEDM screens are set up for. But there's no limit to eight. Um, so for each overlay, um, you can give it a name. You can say, is it enabled or not? And what shape is it? So it can be a rectangle or a cross or text. Um, you could say, how does it draw its data? You know, it, what it's going to do is put that data on top of the image. And it can do it by setting whatever pixel value you specify here in red, green, blue, and just set those pixels to this value. Or there's an operation there that's XOR, so it'll, it'll exclusive OR this number with what's already in the pixel. Because the problem is if you set it to white, and now that part of your image is white, you're not going to see the overlay. But if you do it with exclusive OR, it'll, the, the overlay will turn black. Uh, and then this for each individual overlay, uh, you get this control. So if it's text, uh, you can you know, put in what the text is. And for each of these, the X and Y position and the X and Y size can be Epix PV links. So you can say that where the, the region of interest overlay is located is determined by the PVs that define that region of interest. So if you now go change where that region of interest is, it'll automatically move on your overlay. So here's, here's an example where the overlay is getting it's um, this, this uh, region, the, this box, this rectangle is getting its position from the minimum X and, and minimum Y and size X and size Y of the region of interest. This cross overlay is getting its position calculated by the, the centroid calculated by the statistics plugin. So this image was being captured by the camera. I shown the laser pointer on the wall, the statistics plugin calculated where the centroid of that image was. And I set a threshold so it was basically just seeing the laser pointer intensity. And then the cross tracks that laser pointer right as I move it because it's following uh, the PVs that determine its position are calculated by the statistics plugin. OK, the processing plugin has the standard stuff on the left. In here, you've got the ability to define a background and then subtract that background. So you could say, this frame is a background. And now, enable background subtraction, and that frame will be subtracted from all subsequent frames. Same thing with flat field normalization. You can say, this is a flat field, save it, and then uh, do flat field normalization of all subsequent frames. You could do simple scaling and offset, high and low clipping, change the output data type. And then the, the powerful thing here is this recursive filter. So it's got two images. It's got the previous uh, image, previous processed uh, filtered image, and the new image. And it makes uh, the new one that it just got as a callback. And it makes an output image that is some combination of the stored image and the new image. <clears throat> and these coefficients, by these equations here, determine what that, um, 
you know, how it takes the old image and the new image and combines them to produce uh, an output image. And, you know, there's, there's it's almost unlimited possibilities you can do here by manipulating these coefficients, but there are some that are commonly used and so they're predefined in this menu. There's nothing magic about it, but when you change this filter type here, it'll pre-populate these coefficients with ones for specific operations. Um, so this is an example of using um, the processing plugin to do recursive, uh, to do averaging. So this is, uh, you know, I was running this ProSilica camera with like oh, 30 microsecond exposure time. So there's almost no light captured in each, each frame. So in fact, you can see the histogram here, um, I, which is stretched. It's got, you know, there's only five pixel intensity bins that have any counts. So there's zero count, one count, two, three, four, five, and that's it. So it's very grainy, you can see in the image here, because there's just five intensities. Uh, this is just averaging 100 frames with a recursive average filter, and now you know the image looks much better, and in fact the histogram is quite well populated here. Lots of different grayscales. So the predefined uh, recursive, uh, predefined filters for there are a recursive average where it computes a running average with like a one over n contribution from the new frame. It'll do a, you can do a true average, which just averages the next n frames. You can do a sum of the next n frames. You can do the difference of frame n and frame n minus one. A recursive average difference, which is the difference of frame n from the recursive average of the previous frames. Or you can just copy the new frame to be the, the last stored frame. And also here, there's, there's um, two controls that say auto, so you, you define basically n, you know, which is the number of frames that are involved in the filter. And you could say auto reset filter, yes or no. What that means, as soon as it's done n, does it, does it go back and start over? Or does it just stop once it's done n frames? And then you can say, I want to do callbacks, you know, output my array, every time I do the calculation or only on frame n. So if you're doing a sum or you're doing an average, you can, you can output the intermediate results and display them or whatever, or you can just say, I don't want any of the intermediate results, I just want the final result. You know, I know that at, uh, at sector 34, they were, they were doing this, and then they loaded two standard arrays plugins, because you know, for, for, for the operator display, because they were doing pretty long exposures, but averaging for a, you know, a, a hundred frames, so it might take many minutes. They wanted the operator to see the intermediate results, but they only wanted the final result to go to the file. So they loaded two of these, right? One of them was set to output on every array, and one was set to output just after n arrays. So there's a transform plugin. This is you know, pretty simple. It just takes here the letter F and, uh, and does these geometric uh, transfer. There's only eight possible geometric transformations, including the null operation, um, if all you're doing is mirroring and rotating in increments of 90. Um, and this was rewritten uh, by Chris Rorig recently. Um, and, and speeded it up by you know, one to two orders of magnitude depending on the operation, and also simplified it a lot. Because the other one, you had successive operations. You did this and this and this and this, but in the end, there's only these possibilities. So might as well just make it one operation. So the, the next set of plugins that I want to talk about, there are actually a number um, that are the file-saving plugins. Um, and the, the way this, is, this works is that there's a base class called ND plugin file that handles a lot of the stuff that's common to any file writer um, and then derived classes that implement uh, writing in specific file formats. Those derived classes just have to implement four methods, open, write, close, and read and they don't really have to implement read because we don't use that yet. 
Uh, but someday, you know, we might be able to read a file as a source of ND arrays. So then this wouldn't be a plugin, it would be a driver, right? It's producing arrays. Um, but, the, but the read function doesn't work yet. Um, so it's, it's fairly easy to write a new uh, file plugin, of course, depending on the complexity of the file format that you're trying to save and how much user configurability you want to provide for that. Um, but all of them have common at the current time, and you'll see on one of my final slides of future plans that this is probably going to change because I believe it's confusing to the user. But right now, there are three modes that the file writers can operate in. They save a single array per disk file, or they capture n arrays in memory and then write to disk either as multiple files or as a single large file for file formats that support this. So if the file format supports writing multiple images into a single file, it'll do that. If not, it'll just create a whole bunch of files. And then finally, there's a mode that's stream mode, which streams arrays to a single large disk file, um, but without first capturing them into memory. So this is the fastest method because it, there's no physical disk I.O. happening while the frames are being captured. They're just captured into RAM and then they're written to disk. This, but obviously there's a limit on how many frames you can do that with by the physical memory. Uh, this is unlimited in how, how big the file can be except by the file system, but um, it's not as fast. Um, and for file formats that support it, the file writers don't just store the ND array data, but also the ND attributes. So the file formats that are currently supported are TIFF, and um, it supports now any ND array data type. So you can write signed and unsigned, any size integer, floats, doubles. Um, as of release 2.1, it also stores the attributes as ASCII user tags in the TIFF file. So you can retrieve the values of the attributes as strings from the TIFF file. Um, and right now we don't support multi-TIFF, so we only support writing a single image in each TIFF file. I should say that although the file writer supports any of those data types written into a TIFF file, not all TIFF readers support all of those data types. IDL supports all of them. I've tested it. Uh, the Python imaging library, I remember we were having some trouble with that. There's like two, I forget which two, but there are two formats that the Python imaging library can't handle. Um, uh, and, you know, ImageJ, there were also a couple of formats that ImageJ can't read. <coughs> um, there's a JPEG file writer, so that's you know, for writing compressed images and you can control the compression. Again, it's one array per file and there is no attribute information written to the JPEG file. There's a NetCDF file writer. NetCDF is a popular self-describing binary format supported by this organization called Unidata at UCAR, which is in Boulder, University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. Um, it supports multiple arrays per file. And this plugin uses what's called classic NetCDF, which is a, a NetCDF um, specific binary format. The later, which is bas was basically NetCDF 3. NetCDF 4 and on uses HDF. So the NetCDF people decided it didn't make sense anymore to have their own format. They'll just have their API on top of the HDF5 file format. Kind of like Nexus. You know, Nexus is an API on top of the HDF5 file format. But I, I don't use NetCDF4 here. The only purpose of having this is so that you can write NetCDF3 files. If you're going to write HDF5 files, use the HDF5 plugin. This is somewhat simpler and probably a little higher performance because of it's simpler than the HDF5 file format. Um, then there's an HDF5 file writer 
which writes these HDF5 files with the native HDF5 API, unlike the Nexus plugin that'll be discussed next, which uses the Nexus API. And this supports three types of compression. And a, a really important enhancement to this file writer in release 2.1 of Area Detector is that it supports using an XML file to define the layout and placement of the arrays and the attributes in the HDF5 file. So by, by crafting this XML file, you can control the structure of your HDF5 file. In particular, you could make it a Nexus compliant HDF5 file by writing this XML file correctly. You do not have to provide this XML file. Uh, there's a default layout if you don't, and that default layout is, I believe, also Nexus compliant. So then there's the Nexus file uh, plugin, which uh, Nexus, as I think many of you know, is a standard format for the Neutron and X-ray communities based on HDF5, but it has a, you know, many, many constraints or, or uh, sort of rules about how you write the file so that generic readers know where to look for things like units and, you know, it has things that know about specific kinds of experiments. Um, this may be deprecated in a future release since Nexus files can now be produced with the HDF5 plugin, as I just said, if you use the correct XML layout. Right. So I would recommend that anybody that wants to write Nexus files migrate from using this plugin to using this plugin. <clears throat> and if you have problems, let us know, you know, because the, you know, maybe that we didn't do everything we needed to do in this XML business. And when I say we, I don't mean me. Um, this was all done by a collaboration between Diamond and the APS with uh, Arthur um, here and uh, Ulrich Peterson mainly, I think, at Diamond. Okay, so then there's a plugin that uses uh, a package called Graphics Magic to write files. Graphics Magic is, oh, I mentioned it under the URL driver. It's a, it's a library that knows how to write and read lots of different file formats. So with this, you can write JPEG and TIFF. You can also write PNG and PDF, and there's a whole bunch of file formats that you can write with Graphics Magic. It doesn't support writing the attributes to any of those files. Um, and there's a plugin called ND File Null and it's, it doesn't actually write anything. Its only purpose is to delete the original driver files when no other file plugin is running. And I'll get into that a little bit. It's related to the fact that, remember, for, for detectors like the Pilatus and the MarCCD, the only way they can get their data into area detector is by writing a file, say a TIFF file. But if you've got another file plugin running, that's rewriting that data in your preferred format, like HDF5, when you're done with that, you might want to delete the original file so that your file system doesn't fill up so fast. And the, the plugin can do that. And this one is what you run if you want to delete the files but not even write another file. Okay, here's some uh, recent features that have been added to the uh, ND plugin file uh, base class. Um, first, there's this thing, delete driver file. This isn't super new. It's been around for a couple of years, probably. So it allows file writing plugins to delete this original file that I just mentioned. If the following are all true, that you that you've enabled this with a with an epics record that says yes, I want to delete the original driver file, the file plugin has successfully written a new file and the array contains an attribute called driver file name that contains the full file name of the original file. So the driver attributes XML file should contain this string. And if all three of those conditions are true, then it will delete, the, the, uh, the file plugin will delete the original file. Um, Another feature that's been added is that the file name and number um, that are being written to, instead of coming from the normal Epix PVs where you specify the name of the file, they can come from attributes themselves. So this way, for example, you know, the driver could be determining 
what the name of the output file is going to be, or some attribute could be determining what the name of the output file is going to be. Like it could be automatically saying when it knows that it's collecting dark current images for tomography, it writes a file that has the word dark in it, and when it's collecting a flat field, it writes a file that's got the word flat in it, or something like that. Um, there's a couple of status messages, records, it's not, a, not that important. Okay, so in release 2.1, which came out a couple months ago, um, there's a new feature called Lazy Open. Um, normally, when you're running in stream mode um, and you start to save images, at that point, it opens the file. And in order to open the file, if it's something like HDF5 or NetCDF, it needs to know what's the structure of the data that it's going to be writing to the file. So it needs to know, you know, what's the dimensions of the array? What's the data type of the array? How many attributes are there? Because that's all got to be sort of configured when you open the file. And then when the images start coming in, it just calls the write method. You know, it starts writing to this file that's already been created. The limitation of that is that when you press, you know, start saving or start streaming, if the last image, so the only way the driver knows what the structure of those images is going to be is based on the last image it got. And, you know, users run into problems that they don't understand that, and I understand that they don't understand that. It's kind of complicated. And, you know, maybe it's the, they've never started, the detector hasn't been running, the file plugin hasn't been running, they press start, save, and they get an error. Um, or when it starts streaming, they get an error because the, the new data doesn't match the type of the previous data. So lazy open postpones opening the file until the first uh, image from this new stream arrives. That has the advantage that you don't have to worry about what the previous image was. It has the disadvantage of performance because now the overhead of opening the file is happening when the images are already streaming in. And so you may need to put a bigger queue there to buffer that initial lack of, you know, the initial delay. So that, that capability is now there. Um, there's a new, in version 2.2, which is not yet released, but it's imminent, and all of this stuff is in the master branch on GitHub, um, file plugins can now create directories. So this was a problem, a limitation that, you know, the user wants to create a new directory. They had to go use the file browser to do that. And then, you know, because area detector them itself wouldn't create. And this has some protections. So you, there's a number there where you can say, what's the depth to which a new directory is allowed to be created. Because if they make a typo in the top level, you don't want to build this entire tree of garbage. Um, so you can say, you know, you're only allowed to, to create directories two levels deep. Um, and, uh, or zero level, and you turn it off. Uh, file write plugins now can write files that have a temporary suffix, and then the file is renamed when the writing is complete. And the reason people wanted to do that because they want to say be saving images locally on their hard drive for performance and are syncing it over to some file store, but you don't want to be are syncing a partially written file. So this guarantees that um, the files that you're copying, if you only copy the ones with a certain extension, you know, will be complete by the time you, uh, any time they appear, they're complete. Um, I should say, what I've talked about so far are the file saving plugins. You can also, many of the drivers have the capability to save, uh, to save files as well. You know, the Pilatus, the Princeton Instruments, the Mars CCD. So in addition to the file saving plugins, the vendor library may support saving files. Um, and this is supported at the driver level. Uh, but the file saving plugin could be used instead of or in addition to the vendor file saving, um, you know, because typically the vendor file saving does not have good support for metadata, right? There's no way in the vendor file format to put in the ring current or the motor positions and all that stuff. Um, so, you know, one thing you could do is, but, but perhaps the data analysis code is based upon the vendor file format. That's what everybody's analysis code can read. Um, but it doesn't have the metadata. Well, you could now say, um, uh, well, you could, um, 
the example isn't, that I'm talking about isn't on this view graph, but you could say run your images through a ROI plugin that bins them down, you know, eight by eight. So it's, a, it's kind of a thumbnail, but has all the metadata. So then you could be streaming these little images that have all the metadata in addition to the vendor data, uh, the vendor file that's got the real data. If the data analysis code uses a file format that that area detector can write, then that's probably the better way to do it because everything's in one file. So here's an example of the TIFF uh, file plugin where we've got, you know, megabyte. Yeah, these are 1024 by 1024 images coming in at 82 frames a second, and we're streaming them um, to disk here. Um, so this is running in stream mode, and I've told it to stream a thousand image to capture a thousand images. So it'll it'll as soon as you press start here, it'll start streaming images. It's on number 157 uh, at this point, and you can see here that the number of dropped arrays um, is 83. Um, so it has at least some point since it was last zeroed, it has dropped some frames. It wasn't able to keep up. Here's one writing to a net CDF file um, at uh, 47 frames a second. Again, a mega, megabyte frame um, capture streaming here. And in this case, it hasn't uh, dropped any frames. So you specify where the file goes by sort of four um, or four or five uh, fields here. First, there's the path. Uh, uh, Self-explanatory. Um, if you're on, uh, if if you if the user doesn't type a trailing backslash here, it'll it'll be it'll be inserted, um, and uh, it'll yeah both on Windows and Linux. Um, it'll uh, and then and then there's a file name, and then a file number. A flag that says, should the file number be auto-incremented? And then finally, a C format string that takes this and this and this in that order and builds a string out of it. So in this case, it's percent %s. That means take this and format it as a string. Percent %s, take this and format it as a string underscore, so that's just a hard-coded character. You know, you can put any, any constant characters in this string as well. Um, percent %d, that's the file number here, dot nc, again, hard-coded characters. nc is a convention for NetCDF file extensions. But you could put here, for instance, percent %3.3d to force it to be a three-digit field, and you'd get file numbers like 001, 002, blah, blah, blah. And then when it's done, it'll auto automatically um, increment this number um, <clears throat> to the to by one if you enabled that. Uh, this is the new HDF5 uh, file writer. So HDF5 has this concept of chunking. So you know it sort of writes out blocks of data, and you want to have those that chunk size be a multiple of your image size, you know, for performance. But you don't want it to be too small. Um, there's, there's a whole uh, literature on the, on the chunking stuff, or, or I should say, uh, you know, uh, blogs or email, uh, email uh, exchanges about it. Um, and then here there's the compression. You can choose the compression and the compression parameters uh, over here. And this, it has the concept, which you can read about in the documentation, of extra dimensions. So this is... This is allowing one HDF5 file essentially to, to store a scan, you know, and, and it'll, it'll, it'll know where the frames are in a, in a one or two dimensional scan. The rest of the stuff I think is, uh, is the same as you saw in the, oh, here now we've added this lazy open uh, flag. But that should be now on every, on every file uh, screen because it's, it's in the base class. So all the MEDM screens need to be updated to have that. They probably have that. Um, this is an example, and I, I'm not going to go through it in detail here, but of, of one of those XML files that's used to define the file layout of an HDF5 
uh, 5 file. So you can tell it here where the data goes, um, but also where the metadata goes, the attributes by name. But even if you don't list one of the attributes in this XML file, it will be written to the file in some default location. So you won't lose any of your metadata. OK, and then finally for the lecture, just a couple of slides uh, before I get into future plans on viewers. So area detector, of course, lets you write generic viewers that receive images as EPIC's waveform records over channel access. Uh, and the, the current viewers that, uh, well, there are two viewers that are in the area detector package. The one that almost everybody uses is the ImageJ plugin. Uh, it's called FX AD Display. For those who don't know, ImageJ is a very popular image analysis program written in Java. That's the J. Um, and it, it was originally a, a package called NIH Image. It still comes from NIH. Um, and uh, so this has a, a plugin for ImageJ that does a uh, live image display. And ImageJ has lots of nice uh, features, some of which you can do on this live display, or you can you know, capture one image and then use the full ImageJ capabilities on that captured image. Uh, then there, I've also got an, epic, an IDL uh, display client. There's an FFmpeg server that's I've mentioned previously that allows you to display compressed images in any web browser. But then the FFmpeg, there's another package that's in Area Detector now that's called FFmpeg Viewer. So this is a high performance QT based viewer for that MJPEG stream. So you can view that MJPEG stream in your web browser, but it's not necessarily the most efficient uh, display tool. Um, this FFmpeg viewer that was written at Diamond uh, by Tom Cobb, I believe, um, you know, was written to specifically for this, and, and, and it, it uses a lot less CPU cycles than your typical web browser would. So this is, and we'll, we'll see this in the demo in a second, so I won't spend much time on it. But that's the main image. That's image J, like, out of the box. There's a, a, a plug-in that appears under this menu, which is the Java code um, that comes with Area Detector. That's specific. That's this, that opens this window. Um, and you type here the prefix of the ND standard arrays plug-in that's providing the data. And if it can find those PVs, it starts to get the images from it and shows you the dimensions in X, Y, and Z and how many frames a second it's doing. Um, and you can, it's basically start, start streaming it, stop, obvious stop it. Snap means take the next frame and open a new window with it, a, a, a static window. And capture to stack, if you check that, it now takes all the images and saves them to a three-dimensional stack in image J. Um, you can then, when you turn that off, you can then scroll through those images and see you know, the time series. And then in image J has a file save as, and you could save that as an AVI or you know, what, some other three-dimensional or animation uh, format. It doesn't have a save as MPEG, I believe. That's impossible to read, so I won't say anything about it. OK, so I'm going to just talk about uh, just a summary of the things that have changed recently, because the last time I gave this talk was before 2.0. So the things that have changed in 2.0 was we added this epics timestamp field to the ND array. And now we also changed ASIN device support so that epics records can, get, can have their timestamp be the time when the image was collected rather than the time when that Epix record happened to process. So you can have you know, a whole all set of records whose timestamps are, are internally consistent to be the time that that image was collected. This was something that was particularly important to the people at LCLS, because at LCLS, they modify the Epix timestamp so that the low order nanosecond bits actually are the pulse ID from the Linux. And so they can identify each pulse. You know, uh, the Epix records all encode in their timestamp the pulse ID of the Linux. 
And now area detector supports that as well. So if, if that, they, they have their own timestamp provider and this is using you know, the Epix timestamp general time to get the timestamp. So you can have you know, a site specific timestamp associated with every record. The way you do that is in the record, you set the field called TSE to minus two. That's right, isn't it, Andrew? Yeah. Then it, then it uses the timestamp that device support put into the record. Um, we added this new way to have a user defined written function to set the value of an attribute. In 2.1, um, the transform plugin, uh, thanks to Chris Rorig, greatly simplified and performance improved. This added support for lazy open in the plugin, support for XML file and HDF5, support for all the attributes as ASCII TIFF tags in the TIFF files. Uh, in the overlay plugin, Keith Brister added support for text overlays. And uh, Matt Pearson at Oak Ridge added support for defining the line width in rectangle and cross overlays. That's particularly important if you're trying to display one of these overlays in ImageJ, and ImageJ is not um, like full resolution. You know, it's like displaying binned two by two to get it to fit on your screen. At that point, it can throw away a pixel, and that pixel happens to be the bot, you know, part of your ROI overlay, you don't see it. But you make the pixel, a, you make the box a few pixels wide, then you'll, you're still guaranteed to see it. Um, a lot of people complained about that. Um, support for creating directories and this uh, temporary suffix in the file plugin. This new ROI stat plugin to do simple statistics. Oh, I'm sorry. These, the, the previous page was 2.1. This is 2.2, which is not released. So, um, but it, it, it's on GitHub. So this new ROI stat uh, plugin. And uh, a, a thing that I worked on uh, a couple of months ago, it's always been claimed that ASIN is, you know, basically independent of Epix. The only thing ASIN depends on from Epix is Libcom, which is like this little library of operating system independent utility things for threads and mutexes and, and signals and uh, queuing. Um, and, and since area detector only depends on ASIN, it all should be pretty independent of EPIX. Um, so in area detect AD core now, in the IOCs directory, there's something called SIM detector IOC. That's the example simulation detector. But there's also a SIM detector no IOC. And so this is an example of a C++ application that instantiates a SIM detector outside of an EPIX IOC. So it's just a standalone C++ application. And, uh, that, and, and then it, you know, the code in the C++ application turns the SIM detector on and streams it to an HDF5 file. So it demonstrates that all of that stuff works with the only library that it's linked, only two libraries it's linked against are Libcom and ASIN. Um, so the whole idea is that you now you could think about using this stuff from other control systems, right? You write a, you write an uh, a, a area detector driver and it could be used from Tango. As long as they're willing to link against these two libraries. In fact, if you look at a Tech Talk message that came about a half an hour ago, has anyone used the ASIN driver framework out of an, outside of an Epix IOC? And if so, would you be willing to share your experience? Jimmy Johnson. So there is some interest in that. <laughs> um, OK, some ideas for the future. Um, one thing that confuses a lot of users is that it, in the base class, there's a trigger mode PV, and it has just two, um, it has two states, you know, internal and external. Derived classes are free to change the choices here, but many of them have done something similar to internal and external. And in internal mode, there's, there's two parameters, um, you know, that's, one is the acquire time, and the other is the acquire period. The idea is that the acquire time is the exposure time. 
the period is how often you would like to collect images, right? So you might have a, a one millisecond exposure time, but an acquire period of 100 milliseconds. So you're just doing 10 frames a second at a, at a one millisecond exposure time. Um, a lot of times people just didn't understand how the period was getting involved there. And, and so what we're now proposing is that even in the base class, there be three choices here. Free run, which ignores the acquire period. Fixed rate, which you, you know, basically uses the exposure time only to determine how quickly images are collected. Fixed rate, which uses the acquire period, and then external. Um, and then some of the real detectors would be rewritten uh, to use this new paradigm as well. Some of the drivers, like the one I'm going to show you today, the Prosilica, already uses this paradigm. But other drivers don't. Um, another idea for the, uh, that, that, that is break, you know, it'll break backwards compatibility. I guess you could argue that that other one, the one I just talked about, also does. Um, that the, the, the way, this, right now we have this concept of single stream and capture mode, um, which is confusing to users, and particularly in single mode, you then need to turn on auto save, if you, another flag, if you want to automatically save every file rather than just manually telling it when to save a file. That's Confusing, it's also a little dangerous because if you forget to turn off the autosave flag, then you start streaming images and you don't realize you're filling up your disk. And uh, that, that does happen. So um, the idea is that we would, you know, you'd always probably work. Okay, so the idea is to get rid of this. There's only one mode, uh, but there would be now be two parameters. The number of arrays to save, which we, is already present, but it would be used you would, you would set it to one if you want to be in single mode. So there's no difference between single and stream. It's just that this is one or greater than one. And then the number of arrays per file, which would be new. And this would add additional capability beyond what we have today. Because right now, if you want to stream a whole bunch of images, you want to save a whole bunch of images to an HDF5 file, you basically have to put them all in one file. And this would allow you to independently control how many images per file versus how many images altogether you're saving. And so, and we don't really need this capture mode because you could just make your input queue to this, to this, uh, to the file plugin be large enough to be as big as you would ever want to capture, or you could use that new uh, circular buffer plugin to be your capture buffer, and then. And then stream it to the, and then send it to the file plugin when you've captured enough. Some other future ideas with even further timelines are to put more of functionality into the AD driver base class. For those of you who've looked at drivers or tried to write a driver, you know that there's a lot of stuff that you have to do in your driver. For instance, going and setting the timestamp of the array, getting the attributes and attaching them to the array. And a lot of that could be pushed down into the base class if we structured it right so that each driver wouldn't have to worry about doing that and potentially forgetting to do it or doing it wrong. Um, and, and even doing the, all the callbacks to the plugins. So there could be a whole bunch of stuff that at least by default could be pushed down to the base class. If some detector is special, they could re-implement that method. Each driver that wants to, um, you know, has to do something when somebody changes the exposure time has to implement this write float 64 method, you know, which gets the new exposure time, go through a whole list of parameters to see which one has been changed, and then do the appropriate thing. Rather, it would probably be better that, the, uh, that that's done in the base class, which would then call, for example, set exposure in the derived class. So in your real driver, you would implement not something like wrote, wrote, write float 64, but more um, clear methods like set exposure, set period, um, you know, set binning, um, and so on. That's the way that the Model 3 motor driver, which some of you might be familiar with, works. It's also based on this ASIN port driver, but when you write a derived class, you know, you implement um, axis move, 
or axis stop. You don't implement read uh, write float write int 32 or write float 64. Um, another idea is for a plugins that could do multiplexing and demultiplexing because let's say you've got some very compute intensive task that you want to do. And right now, if you've got a processing plugin, you in, in your chain, you can only have one of those, right? So you can only use one core to do that task. But if we wrote uh, a, a, a demultiplexing plugin that fanned out to a bunch of those, of those uh, plugins that did the processing, and then a multiplexer that put them back together, you could be using more cores for the same task. You know, the challenge is getting them in the right order when they come out. That's, that's the hard part. You gotta, that, that requires some thought. Um, the fanning them out is easy. You know, the, you know, as long as each, each, each plugin goes and pulls the next available frame and works on it, but when they come out the other end, what happens if one of them got stuck? You know? And so that's something we might want to add. Um, another, another idea is taking some of these same concepts that have been pretty successful for area detector and pushing them to other types of detectors, like ADCs, which are producing, say, buffered data, uh, electrometers, waveform digitizers, multi-channel analyzers. So these things all produce 1D or sometimes 2D data that could uh, benefit from the same, not just the same ideas for plugins, but in many cases, the same plugins could be used for these kinds of detectors. You know, saving the data to disk, region of interest, Fourier transforms, you name it. So I think this is probably the way we'll be going in the future. We've already started it a bit. The quad electrometer support, for instance, produces ND arrays. So does the mapping in the DXP uh, software for XIA uh, spectrometers. But there's a lot of support out there that doesn't do this right now. And, um, and so you, know, you can't stream the data from an IP330 ADC right now to disk, right? Except yeah, there's no good way to do that. Uh, but if it were packaged into an ND array, we could do that. But we want, might want to make some different base classes from which, you know, because a, 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 an ADC really isn't the same as an area detector. So we probably wouldn't be inheriting from AD driver. We'd be inheriting from some new base class that's more appropriate for that kind of instrument. I've already mentioned this exporting arrays to <laughs> FXV4. That allows multiple processes. We already talked about that. Let me just say a little bit about the area detector collaboration. So the move to GitHub has really helped area detector to become a collaborative effort. There are a lot more people contributing now uh, by adding new features and fixing, bug, uh, fixing bugs. Um, if, for those who are, don't, uh, well, on GitHub, this is really, it's really convenient. You know, you, you fork um, the repository that you're working on into your personal area on GitHub, then clone it down to some machine here where you're going to work on it, put it back to GitHub, and issue what's called a pull request. And then the people that are maintaining Area Detector, me or, or uh, Tom Cobb, we see this request. We can look and see what you've changed and then you know, merge it into uh, Area Detector. Without, you know, we're not talking about sending emails of patches and this kind of stuff. It's a much more easy to use um, feature than that. We also now have a collaboration meeting approximately once a month on Google Hangout. And the people that normally participate are Ulrich Peterson, who organizes it. He's at Diamond. Uh, myself and Arthur from here. Matt Pearson from Oak Ridge. Marty Kramer, who's kind of, you know, independent but nominally at Brookhaven. And then Nick Rees, uh, David Hicken, and Tom Cobb sometimes participate. They're at Diamond as well. And we've been having now in-person meetings roughly twice a year. And we've you know, developed a roadmap of sorts. And you know, I think we're making some progress in, in following that roadmap. And certainly welcome you know, more people to join this uh, collaboration. And a number of people in this room have made significant contributions. OK, so conclusions. I think air, area detector architecture works pretty well. You can easily extend it to new drivers and plugins. Uh, so th this comes back to the, the point I was making uh, a few minutes ago, that it's not, 
you know, there, a lot of these concepts and the plugins themselves are not limited to these 2D detectors. They could be used on other types of detectors. And in, and in some cases, they already have been. Okay, so the documentation is on our website here. Um, and then everything is on GitHub here. And it's the Area Detector Project. And then each of these repositories is uh, in, this, uh, in this project. And finally, let me just you know, acknowledge a lot of people are, have worked on this already. People at the APS, Brian Tiemann, who's no longer with us, Tim Madden, Tim Mooney, Arthur Glowicki, John Hammonds, Chris, I've probably forgotten some people, um, Ulrich, Tom, and Nick from Diamond, Alan Greer from Observatory Sciences, Matt Pearson, who used to be at Diamond but is now at Oak Ridge, Emma Shepard, who used to be at Diamond and is now at the Australian Synchrotron, uh, Lewis Muir, Keith Brister, and uh, from the cats here, Bruce Hill from Slack, a lot of other people that have given ideas, enhancements, and bug fixes. Thank my funding agency and thank you for your attention. The question was, I've got a fly scan where, say, motor pulses are triggering an area detector, which is streaming data to disk, but it's also triggering something like the struck, which is collecting, say, the I0 data um, from my ion chamber at each point in the image, and then I'm done with a scan, and I've got a few 1D arrays of, of struck uh, multi-channel data and a bunch of images uh, from area detector. Right now, there is no way to combine those into one file. Um, there's not even a really good way to save the struct data unless you're using the scan record, right? You, it, because the, the only way to get that array data out of, unless you write your own client um, that reads the struct data and writes a file, but using an I, you know, doing everything inside the IOC, um, there's not even, you have to use the scan record with the scan H, the 1D scan data type, to save the struct. And that's not very good at saving the metadata. I mean, I, you could, right? But, um, so I think the first order, my first order answer to that would be to take the struct and make it, like I was just talking about here, an area detector-like object so that it could be streaming data. Now, it wouldn't be going to the same file, but it could be going to you know, a file that's very similar in its name and it's in the same place. Um, the only way, well, that I can think of right now that you could get them in the same place would be to do it somehow with attributes. But as you asked, you know, attributes are not one, to, you know, they're not arrays. It could be an, an attribute in the file saving plugins, or at least the HDF5 file saving plugin. You know, you have attributes that come with each image, and 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 then there are some that can get added by the file plugin itself, right? It can have its own attributes file. But with the with the HDF5 writer, you can say, does this attribute get written to the HDF5 file? only once when it's opened, only once when it's closed, or on every image, right? So if the attribute were the, were the struck, and you, if that were allowed, and you said, I only want to write it when it's closed, um, then you know, that's a possible way to do it. It's a common problem. The common solution, or I, I think the way many people are doing it is they're writing a Python script that's, that's doing that global stuff. I mean, part of the problem is that the Epic scan record for this on-the-fly stuff isn't ideally suited to that because, you know, it's, it's sort of written on the idea of trigger the motor, then trigger the detector, and um, whereas what you want with an on-the-fly scan like this is to arm the detector and then start the motor. Right, so it's in the opposite order. So then you have to use the pre-scan stuff to do that. At which point, and at that point, the scan record isn't buying you much. So the second part of the question was, what's the order? They are collected as soon as the image arrives in the driver. It calls basically a method that's you know get attributes, and at that instant, it for each kind, if it's if it's a detector attribute a parameter attribute, it just gets the current value of that parameter from the, from the current driver 
via ASIN. You know, it, it, um, if it's an EPIX PV, it uses the last monitor callback that it got on that PV as the source of the data. Um, yeah. So that's when it happens, is, is at the instant that, that that image was collected. Assuming you're talking about attributes that were added at the driver level. If they were added somewhere further up in the plugin scheme, it's the same thing. It's just that each of those plugins calls get attributes, and they'll get the current value of the attribute. 